Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. I'm glad you joined us for today's podcast. We're going through a special series called Simply by Grace, the book. When I wrote Simply by Grace, I never dreamed it would have such an impact and be translated into a dozen languages with more in the works. It's published in English by Kriegel, and you can get the book at our website, gracelife.org, or on Amazon, or wherever you buy your paperback or digital books. Like a lot of folks, you might want to buy a bunch and hand them out to people who need a better understanding of God's amazing grace. Grace Life ministers around the United States and the world sharing the gospel of grace with unbelievers and the grace of the gospel with believers. Our ministry is supported by folks just like you, and that too can be done on our website, gracelife.org. What we'll do now is read a chapter of Simply by Grace and follow that with an interview on the topic of that chapter with someone who's going to give further insights about that aspect of God's grace. So, if you're ready, we'll dive into the book. As we begin, I'm going to skip over the endorsements by people I greatly admire and whose words I greatly appreciate, such as Dr. Roy B. Zook, Dr. David Anderson, Dr. Larry Moyer, Dr. Fred Librand, and Dr. Jack Lewis. And go immediately to reading the book, which is copyrighted in 2009 under the name Charles C. Bing. I did dedicate the book, by the way, to my wife, Karen, who is and has always been God's grace to me. I'm so grateful to uh, Dr. Charles C. Ryrie for writing kind words in the foreword. So I will begin there. Forward. Grace distinguishes Christianity from all other religions, and grace can affect all areas and aspects of one's life. Yet grace, such a beautiful and important concept, is often misunderstood, limited in its applications, or mixed with impurities. Dr. Bing makes none of these mistakes. This book, which deals accurately and comprehensively with the subject of the grace of God, is needed and most welcome. Clear and easy to understand, it explores the many facets and ramifications of grace. Unequivocal in his position, the author nevertheless represents other views fairly and kindly. Today. Errors regarding additions to and misstatements about grace abound in thinking, teaching, and preaching. Dr. Bing has dealt carefully with what the Bible says about grace in many areas. Salvation, justification, sanctification, security, assurance, and discipleship are examined accurately and clearly. Key Bible passages are plainly interpreted and so-called problem passages are not avoided or strained to fit a preconceived conclusion. To spend time in this book will not only sharpen and broaden one's understanding of grace, but will also deepen one's love and appreciation for the grace of God and the God of all grace. Charles C. Ryrie, Th.D., Ph.D. Introduction A question posed years ago at a British conference on world religions sparked a lively debate. What makes Christianity unique among all other religions in the world? Some argued that it was the Incarnation, others the Resurrection. But some replied that other religions had similar beliefs. When C.S. Lewis walked into the room, someone explained their quandary. Oh, that's easy, he said. It's grace. How does Christianity distinguish itself from every other religion? Simply by grace. How does a person become a Christian? Simply by grace. How can a person be eternally saved? Simply by grace. How can one know that one is eternally saved? Simply by grace. How can one live the Christian life? Simply by grace. How should a Christian be motivated to serve God and others? Simply by grace. Do these seem like understatements or overstatements? They could seem like either unless you understand what God's grace is in its simplest meaning. Only when you understand the simplicity of His grace can you also begin to understand its deep riches. Simply by grace implies that the answer to a lot of confusion about salvation in the Christian life 
is found in a simple and accurate understanding of grace. I say this not to trivialize grace, but to rescue it from the encumbrances of those who confuse its meaning, complicate its simplicity, or teach it inconsistently. Grace is a word commonly used among Christians and non-Christians, but too often it's misunderstood or at least underappreciated. Christians, of course, believe in grace, or they really wouldn't be Christians because the Bible says, by grace you have been saved, Ephesians 2.8. Non-Christian religions and quasi-Christian cults also use the word grace frequently. So what does it mean? And why does it make a difference to us? You might think that a consistent view of grace would result from intense Bible study, the kind someone would receive in a Bible college or seminary. But having graduated with three degrees from such schools with three different groups of colleagues, and having interacted with many more people since then, I can tell you there are vastly different views of grace. Churches differ in their views, pastors differ, professors differ, and therefore many Christians are confused. In my study of the Bible and in teaching and preaching it for over 30 years, I've come to see that one's concept of God's grace is not only the key to becoming a Christian, but it is also the key to the assurance of salvation and living in freedom to serve God and others. That's why I've devoted my life and ministry to sharing the message of God's grace with people everywhere I go and however I can. While it is my privilege to know many Christians who understand grace clearly, I've also met or read works by many others who have distorted God's grace to the detriment of those who need to be saved, those who are not sure they are saved, and those who need a firm foundation for Christian living. This distortion confuses the simple grace of God to the point of making it void. Between those who understand grace clearly and those who distort it is a larger group of people who use the language of grace and sing songs about grace but have not applied its truth consistently or clearly in their beliefs about salvation and the Christian life. Grace grounds us in the Christian life. If you don't understand the nature of grace, you will have problems and confusion in some area of life. You are not well grounded in grace, for example, if you're confused about how to obtain eternal life, or you're not sure that you ever had eternal life, or you're not sure that you now have eternal life, or you're not sure that you'll keep eternal life, or you have trouble feeling accepted by God, or you don't feel like you've done enough to please God. You don't feel that you are good enough to please God. Or maybe you're struggling with sin, guilt, and forgiveness. You have trouble forgiving others. You are judgmental towards others. You hate yourself. You hate others. The list could go on, but getting grounded in God's grace will help resolve all of these issues and more. Those grounded in grace appreciate more fully what God has done in their salvation, and they are properly motivated to live a life that glorifies God. They accept more easily who they are, how God sees them, and how they should see others. They find a new power over their weaknesses and understand the gift of forgiveness. This book is a discussion that introduces the major issues related to God's grace helping you be well-grounded in it. My prayer is that it will help you understand the beauty of the grace that gives us eternal life and abundant life so that you can be free to be all that God made you to be, simply by grace. Chapter 1 The Gift of Grace A feast lay before me. One buffet was seafood, another Italian, and a third Mexican. Then there was, of course, the variety of salads and desserts. In the background, a big band played rockin' big band swing music, some of my favorites. It was a first-class wedding reception in an old plantation-style mansion at a picturesque country club in Louisiana. And I didn't know a single person there. Well, I knew the pastor friend who invited me to come along. He assured me the families would be glad to have me. I was in town to speak at my friend's church, and he and his church folks were all attending the wedding and reception on this Saturday night, so rather than sit alone in someone's home, I went. I enjoyed a feast I didn't deserve. That would be a good illustration of what grace means. But there's more to the story. 
You see, the wedding was paid for well in advance by the bride's father, who knew he was dying of cancer. We watched a video tribute to him as we enjoyed his free gift to his daughter, her husband, and all their family and friends, and at least one stranger. I enjoyed a gift that I didn't deserve, which was paid for by someone I never knew. Now that is grace. A feast awaits those who enter the truth about grace. Most know that the Bible speaks about grace and perhaps also know that grace has something to do with the gift. But that far from exhausts the depths of the beauty of grace or settles the confusion that surrounds the word. It shouldn't be this way, though. While grace is indeed a profound truth, it is a simple concept. The Meaning of Grace A little background will help you understand grace. The word grace is found in the English Bible about 148 times, depending on the version you read. In the English translation of the Old Testament, grace is used about 20 times and translates a couple of different words from the original Hebrew. In the New Testament, it is used 128 times and mostly translates one word from the Greek. Just as does English, the Old Testament reflects some general uses of the word. In English, people use the word grace to denote a prayer said before dinner or to describe a thing of beauty or an elegant performance. In the Old Testament, grace sometimes translates the idea of beauty or charm. But the main Hebrew word that is translated grace comes from the word that means to show favor. Some think that this Hebrew word comes from the idea of someone who is in a superior position bending or stooping to help a needy person in an inferior position. I like what a popular pastor once said, Love that goes upward is worship. Love that goes outward is affection. Love that stoops is grace. Grace is God's loving way of meeting our needs by showing us favor we do not deserve. A story from the Old Testament book of Ruth helps us visualize what grace means. Three times in chapter 2, Ruth refers to finding favor with a man named Boaz in verses 2, 10, and 13. To appreciate what this means, we must know that Ruth was a starving Gentile Moabite widow, a loser on four counts in the eyes of the Jews. She traveled to Jerusalem with her mother-in-law Naomi to find food and help. Ruth goes to the fields to glean leftover heads of grain, hoping to find food and perhaps find favor with Boaz, the very rich landowner. Boaz notices her and offers her his fields to glean his protection, water, food, and eventually his hand in marriage. The rich Boaz stooped to help the lowly Ruth in her desperate need. But his grace was not just metered in meals. It was lavished in love. The word grace can also be used in some general ways in the New Testament. For example, as a greeting or blessing. But more importantly, in the New Testament, grace is used as a specific word that defines theological truths about eternal salvation and the Christian life. The New Testament book that best helps us understand grace is Romans. No wonder, because that book uses the word grace 28 times more than any other New Testament book. Romans explains how grace makes us susceptible to God and how it helps us live to please Him. Romans also supplies a couple of key descriptions of grace. An unconditional free gift. The word usually translated as grace in the New Testament is the Greek word charis. It simply means a free gift. By free, we mean that it it is totally undeserved. Nothing that a person does, commits, surrenders, or promises can earn or merit grace. It is therefore an unconditional gift. By unconditional, we mean that God, as the giver of grace, does not put any such conditions on people before they can receive his gift. When someone tries to earn the gift of grace, it ceases to be grace. Romans 4, verse 4 says, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Grace, then, is a gift given freely and without conditions. If we work for it, it's no longer grace, but a wage, a paycheck for our work. When it comes to our eternal salvation, God does not pay wages. He gives eternal life only as a gift. When you receive a paycheck for a week of hard work, you tell your employer, thanks so much for this wonderful blessing. 
I really don't deserve it. It's more likely you feel you deserve to be paid more. Another defining passage, Romans 11.6, says that the concepts of works and grace should not be confused. It reads, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. The concept of earning or meriting something based on who we are or how we perform is contrary to the biblical concept of free, unmerited, unconditional grace. The concepts of work and grace are mutually exclusive. They do not mix any more than oil and water. Suppose your neighbor washes your car as an act of kindness, not expecting or wanting anything from you in return. That would be an act of grace. Even if you were to reciprocate and give him something as a reward, and even if he took it, that would not compromise his pure act of grace. If, however, your neighbor requires payment before he will wash your car, grace is totally negated. Instead of giving grace, he is now requiring a payment. Unconditional grace cannot be conditioned on any work, payment, or promise. A Spiritual Gift Grace as a gift is sometimes expressed by the Greek word for spiritual gift, charisma, which comes from the same Greek word for grace as above, charis. God gives Christians spiritual gifts for use in ministry. They are not earned or achieved. They are bestowed by God, the giver of all good things. These words for gift and grace are combined in 1 Peter 4.10, which says, As each one has received a gift, charisma, Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace, charis, of God. Just as no one can earn or deserve God's specific spiritual gifts, neither can anyone earn or deserve God's gift of eternal life. Understanding that grace is God's free gift to us is the first step in becoming grounded in grace. By gift, we mean that it is absolutely free, unconditional, and undeserved. Any other definition of grace has serious repercussions for one's view of salvation, assurance of salvation, the Christian life, and ministry. Any attempt to be worthy of it, to deserve it, to merit it, to trade a commitment for it, or to perform at a certain level for it will negate grace so that it ceases to be grace. Those who are not grounded in a clear understanding of God's absolutely free grace will not find peace and rest in their relationship with God and others. That may sound severe, but think about it. If grace must be earned or deserved, we could never know when we've done enough to earn it or when we're good enough to deserve it. Knowing that grace is absolutely free allows us to enjoy our relationship with God, ourselves, and others, and it gives God the infinite pleasure of giving us a gift because, as we will see in the next chapter, He is the God of all grace. Review questions. 1. What is biblical grace? 2. Explain and expand the idea of unconditional in relation to grace. 3. Explain how grace and works are related. 4. Why is it so important to understand that grace is absolutely free? Well, I thought it would be good to talk to Dr. David Anderson about our topic, which is uh, grace as a gift, the gift of grace. Because in many ways, I think, as I've known Dave, his life is much defined by by grace, and I'll let him maybe tell you a bit how and why about that, but um, I guess he's best known today as founder and president of Grace School of Theology, which is based in Houston, but reaches around the world, and uh, we're going to ask him about that in a second, but I've also served on the board with him of Free Grace Alliance. He's one of the founding members of the Free Grace Alliance, and he also pastored Faith Bible Church in Houston for 18 years is right right? 18 years. So he's still active as a speaker and a conference speaker. I'm looking forward to hearing him next month. In fact, not to mention all the books he's written, especially his free grace theology. And then uh, some 
commentaries on First um, John, Galatians, Ephesians, Maximum Joy is First John, Bewitched is Galatians, and Position and Condition is Ephesians, right? Right. You want to mention any other books of that list? You got chapters in a lot of books. Well, Saving the Saved is a book I wanted to write for years. It's on okay. First Peter. First Peter, that's right. And I think First Peter is is uh, a commentary on Matthew 16, 24 through 27, where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to save their lives. In other words, how to make them count for eternity. Yeah. So I, first Peter that, tells, I read the book and I, I wrote a recommendation for it, so I should know that. <laughs> You've got too many books out there to remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, but. You know, currently people know you, you, you graduated from Rice University, Dallas Theological Seminary. You got your doctorate there and studied, did doctoral studies in Europe as well. All we, we, you got too many credentials to mention, take the whole show, but tell us, uh, you've been such an advocate for grace. Um, and that I know that that's behind why you started Grace School of Theology. Tell us why we needed another school of theology or seminary. Well, uh, As the reform movement has kind of swept over America like a tsunami, and not just America, uh, there are fewer and fewer schools that were uh, teaching a theology through which you could find assurance for your salvation. You certainly don't get it through reform theology because they think uh, one of their five tenets or five points, or even some people call them the five graces, is that you have to persevere faithfully to the end of your life, or you never were left. Well, uh, that turns the Christian life into a have to instead of a want to. And that's the difference between a job and a joy. So I think the Christian life should be one of joy. And you really can't have joy if you're on pin needles wondering if you're going to make it to the end. If uh, the fruit you have is uh, enough fruit or is it good enough fruit? or It just leads to a life of introspection. Yeah. And... Uh... I think sometimes, you know, this is very subjective, but I think you can even see it in their faces and and in the tone of their churches and worship. Yeah. Uh, well, Michael Eaton uh, says he wrote his dissertation on the subject. He He's a, yeah. a scholar from uh, Great Britain, and uh, he I think he belonged to All Souls Church, although I'm not 100% sure of which church it was. But he said it got to be dissertation time, and he just looked around and said, why is there no joy in my church? And so he started investigating, and he he said it turned out to be their theology. And so he wrote his dissertation on that, then turned that into a layman's version, no condemnation, right? uh, which uh, I think a lot of people have read. Mainly concerning the book of Galatians, and I actually talked to him about that, and he said that he would read the book of Galatians to his wife at night while they were going to sleep in bed. And he could see visibly night after night, her face changing. Huh. He, he saw the change come over her from just a joyless, expressionless face to actually having joy. So he brought assurance to uh, at least uh, his corner of reform theology. But um, uh, he passed several years ago and wrote a commentary on the whole Bible called The Branch, which is from an amillennial perspective, but at least he got assurance right and the gospel right and uh, considered himself free grace. But, uh, well, he was an interesting character. Uh, Why is uh, grace such a passionate uh, issue with you, Dave? Well, I I think if you've experienced it, it uh, leaves an indelible imprint in your life and you want to pass it on. So, uh, I certainly experienced it uh, when I became a believer at age 17 and had a strong desire from that moment on to pass it on. I didn't know how. I had no training in evangelism. I stumbled the first time I tried. So I kind of went, I became kind of a secret service Christian for a couple of years. And then a camp for Savior Christ got a hold of me and they taught me how. I went out to Balboa Beach in California and a guy named Hal Lindsey and Bill Counts and Jimmy Williams with Crusade at, at that time uh, taught us how we went on the beaches. And uh, Without that, I wouldn't be where I am because I learned that uh, leading someone to Christ is one of the great joys of living on this earth. Uh, I was pre-med at Rice at the time, thought uh, I would go into medicine, but 
I used to work at the Ben Tob on Saturday nights in the emergency room, which is about as exciting as medicine gets. Mm-hmm. But leading someone to Christ uh, uh, far out uh, weighed that as far as excitement in my life. <laughs> Nothing like bringing something of eternal significance into somebody's life, not just sewing them up from an accident, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I went through some of Cruz training initially also, and it gave me great confidence in sharing the gospel. Of course, they shared a little differently than I would today. Uh, and people often ask me, oh, you know, they'll say, Charlie, when did you become free grace? Uh, and, and my answer to them, in, and I'm, I'm interested in your answer, but my answer is I just kept reading the Bible <laughs> and kept understanding uh-huh. it better and refining my beliefs as I went. There wasn't any particular moment or person. Well, what's your story on that? Well, I became a believer by reading the Bible, and it was a requirement at the high school I was going to, hmm. and it was a, a pilgrim Bible, which is a uh, was a dispensational uh, Bible in its notes. Think in terms of Schofield Reference Bible, but this was made more for uh, younger people, I think. Hmm. So I kind of cut my teeth on those notes, and uh, it was free grace. I mean, free grace, people think of, of as something new. It's of course, if you think it's from the Bible, it's not new. But, you know, it, it, uh, it's it been around a long, long time. You know, Charles Ryrie was free grace. And, you know, Louis Berry Schaefer. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just Ephesians 2. Yeah, I, I happen to believe Paul was free grace, too. Yeah, that's why I said back <laughs> in the Bible, we know it's not new because yeah. we find it in the scriptures. But, but uh, anyway... As much as we have different theological systems today, I tell people nobody gets saved except by free grace. So right. <laughs> they just it just evolves into something else after a while. You know, when I when I was learning to witness, <laughs> I take people to Ephesians two eight and nine, where it says it's a gift of God, you know, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'd sit there and say, I'm thinking of a certain person right now, and said, I say, well, David, um, what do you think a gift? Of, uh, What's the difference between a gift and a bribe? And they'd think a well, while and tell me. What's the difference between a gift and a salary? And they'd think a well, while and tell me. What's the difference between a gift and a loan? And they'd think a well, while and tell me. I said, well, this is a gift, isn't it? So no strings attached. You can't earn it. You don't have to pay it back. And uh, it's something that's yours forever. Uh, have you ever thought of eternal life being a gift like that? And they'll say, golly, I never have. Right. I can't tell you the number of people I've led to Christ once they understood the gift. That's, that's interesting. It's also interesting because there are so many who are involved in evangelism and ministry who don't have the same definition of grace. Um, you know, they, they speak of a costly grace or you have to do certain things to earn it or deserve it or sacraments to keep it uh, or to, to get it and, and then do things to keep it or prove it. Uh, so how exactly do you define grace for those who are listening? Well, kind of as I just did, no strings attached. Uh, you don't have to do anything on the front end. If you think in terms of mutual funds, there's no front end load. You don't have to do anything on the back end and back end load. So there's no commission on the way in or the way out. Now, bringing that out of financial terms, uh, you don't have to do anything in front of uh, receiving this gift, in front of believing to deserve it. And once you've received it, you don't have to do anything to prove you have it, or that would still be another requirement, something you're adding to uh, this gift. And it's either a gift or it's not. Uh, People often ask me, well, why do you call it free grace? Isn't that redundant? I mean, isn't grace defined as, you know, an undeserved favor? And so you're saying uh, an undeserved, undeserved favor. I say, well, no, we do it because the Bible does it. Just the verse we just quoted, the word, the word gift, derea, is connected to grace. And apparently the Holy Spirit knew that everyone in Christianity is going to talk about grace. The Roman Catholics talk about grace more than Protestants. Uh-huh. In fact, the uh, sacraments are all means of grace. You can't get to heaven without grace, but through the sacraments you find grace. Well, I think you want to make it clear, no, it's an absolutely free gift. And so uh, in Ephesians 3, over in Romans 5, there in Ephesians 2, we've got grace and gift put side by side five times. So the Bible itself talks about free grace. 
It does. Yeah. Uh, my favorite verse is Romans 3.24, uh, freely by his grace. Uh, there's a redundancy there. I think, and as always, redundancies means an emphasis, but sometimes we have to clarify things when they're in, we're in a controversy, like it used to be enough to say the word of God, but now we have to say the inerrant word of God or the inspired inerrant word of God and so forth, just, just to make ourselves clear. But there, there are so many theological systems and people that uh, don't believe in an absolutely free, unconditional gift of grace. And their reaction to it is sometimes really visceral. I just got back from Eastern Europe and um, where most of uh, speaking to a Baptist group and the Baptists over there are Arminian, meaning they believe you can lose your salvation. This group was a little friendly towards me, but they, they said, there's a lot of places you cannot speak that they'll drive you out. They won't let you t- teach eternal security, which of course is a consequence of grace. Why do you think people have so much trouble? It, it, they just get angry at this idea of eternal security, which is a consequence of grace. But why do you think so many people have trouble understanding or accepting gift, the grace as a free gift? You know, uh, uh, it's interesting. If you've read much of Augustine or Augustine, however you want to pronounce it, he writes about free grace more than any uh, writer I've ever read. It's just that he puts all these uh, qualifications to receive the free grace, which is, of course, a... uh, a contradiction but the flesh our flesh always wants to get involved that's what my book on galatians is about bewitched Mm -hmm. Uh, there's some way it wants to get get in there and the flesh itself is what i think cannot receive the wonderful unconditional gift of grace you know it's interesting uh uh, a lot of the reformed people talk about the uh, five graces so they would say that uh salvation's an unconditional free gift that God forces upon you. You have no choice in the matter. Uh-huh. You're a spiritual corpse. And so God does it all. And he would say, we are the ones who are putting conditions on it because we say you at least have to believe. If, if I offer you a mission, a missionary a free gift of a car, hold the keys out, I'm not going to force the keys down your throat. You still have to reach out and receive what I'm offering. So right. they say, oh, 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 you've put a work in there. Now you've got works in there. Well, a condition is not necessarily a work, however. Correct. Yeah. yeah in fact, the that. Bible says that faith and works are you know opposed, Romans 4, 4 and 5. Right. So, yes, there's a condition to receiving God's grace. It's faith, but faith is opposed to work. So uh, condition and works are not uh, synonyms for one another. Paul makes that clear in Romans 4. But, yeah, do you think that the, the flesh... When you're talking about flesh, I'm thinking about pride. Uh, isn't there a temptation for people to want to say, I, I participate in some way? Um, I think it's built into us to think we have to deserve it. In fact, I think it's one of the stoicheia that uh, Paul talks about in uh, Galatians 5. It's, it's the uh, basic principles of life, and I think one of them is the performance principle. I think that's the essence of legalism. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh is to think I have to perform to receive God's blessing. Yeah, performance is the opposite of grace. It's always something that uh, people feel like they need to do to be acceptable to God. But um, he, has, he accepts us on the basis of his son, Jesus Christ. So uh, that, that's a big yeah. deal. As Ephesians puts it, you're accepted in the beloved. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, so in uh, Gray School of Theology, you call yourself the seminary to the world. And how many countries are you in now? Uh, we're in 40. 40 countries? Yeah, we're teaching in, I think, six different languages. I know I'm sending okay. some students there. Well, yeah, yeah, I've got one in my class, Didi is his nickname. He's from uh, Burundi, Burundi, I think. Diomed, yeah. Didi, I didn't know that was his nickname. Yeah, he's, yeah. Guy. he's our translator there. Uh, so his yeah. English is pretty good to begin with. Well, you know, we had a faculty meeting this morning, and uh, it's interesting that you think of faculty meetings, everyone's getting together in a room, but we're all getting together on the equivalent of Zoom. So I had people there from uh, Nepal, people from the Philippines, people from uh, Billingham, Bellingham, uh, Washington, uh, just all, it, it reminded me of Romans, I mean, Revelation 7, every tongue driving nation. It was just a beautiful thing to see all these 
professors all over the world, uh, Brazil, just uh, sharing the same message for a world that's hungry for it. I mean, the world's never been hungrier than right now because there's so much hatred, so much doubt, so much fear if, uh, from pandemics and otherwise. Uh, if you can teach them about a love that can't be earned and can't be lost, you have, you have a ready audience, I guarantee. And you yeah. know that from all your travels. Yeah, and it's not that the world isn't religious already, uh, but the religions are mainly legalistic religions, meaning that they're saying you have to do this and that in order to be a Christian, in order to be a right. good Christian, or you'll lose your salvation. You either got to earn it or, or try to keep it or prove that you're a Christian. Uh, it just seems like most of the world has missed out on the concept of what unconditional grace is. So it must be very gratifying to see your faculty spreading yeah. this message all over the world. And they well, really are doing that. It was one of the uh, motivations for the school because, you know, uh, I was told by a Wycliffe Bible translator uh, that I was in graduate school with that every tribe has been reached in Papua New Guinea with the gospel. They haven't all been reached with the translation of the New Testament, which takes 15 years. Uh, same thing when I was in India. I went to a place in India uh, where the gospel had come there too. Uh, 100 years before through Carrie's ministry, I think. Yeah. But there wasn't a single church there. So uh, grace had come and gone in a way, you might say. And unless someone comes along to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you, see, all these groups, are not all of them, many of these groups want to go out and just evangelize. That's only half the Great Commission. The other half is to disciple them, to, to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded. And why? Because Galatians... You know, within depending on when you think Galatians was written, possibly within two years of those churches being established, they drifted into legalism. That's the default system. Yeah. Flesh is our default system. So if you don't come along and train these new believers and these new pastors, uh, they will slip into legalism. Yeah, and I know that some missions agencies will actually pull out of some countries claiming that they are reached with the gospel because I think their definition is that there's a, a church or a Christian witness in, in that community or that country or that county or region or whatever, and say that they will pull out. But what I'm finding is when I come in to areas like that is, yes, they're religious, and yes, they call themselves Christians, and they may well be, but their idea of the gospel is so mixed up and inconsistent. And I, I, I take surveys to find these things out, and I talk to them, I interact with them, that if they they're committed to do the work of evangelism that I can't do because of language and cultural barriers. But if we can get their message straightened out, which is what, you know, your school is working to do what I'm working to do, we can get their message straightened out. We we've, we've done a great uh, service to that area uh, that goes beyond just religious practices and traditions. Um, so we, we try to get people grounded in the gospel of grace and uh, that's what grace school of theology is doing too. So um, it's an important work and it must be very gratifying to see all those people meet together. It is. Uh, yeah. Now you've, uh, also, um, continuing to write, are you, are you working on something right now? Yeah, I've got a new book coming out. It should be at Christmas, uh, called relationship and fellowship. It's different from all my other books where I've just taken like a first Peter or first John and Ephesians and done a commentary. I wrote those books because people kept coming to me saying they couldn't find a free grace perspective yeah. among the commentaries. Absolutely. And Grand Rapids seemed to produce the commentaries and they're all reformed. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't trying to sell books. I was just trying to give them an alternative uh, and give them our approach to certain books. This time I'm taking more, uh, trying to uh, familiarize people with the categories. Kind of like you told me one time when you heard me speak about A truth and B truth. Yeah, And it clicked in your mind, mm -hmm. and you started putting things under A, truth, justification, and B, truth, sanctification. A, truth, the gift. B, truth, the prize. A, truth, acceptance. B, truth, approve, approval, and, and so on. And keeping those categories separate is, is paramount, I think, in trying to understand the Bible. So uh, it's a shorter book than most of mine, but I wrote, uh, I just put together a bunch of uh, sermons as illustrations of interpreting scripture through a truth and B truth or uh, what I'll call a relationship and fellowship. And then I, I for seminarians uh, or 
pastors who've gone to seminary. I wrote about a third of the book, giving the scholarship behind the relationship fellowship concept. So I went back into the covenants, and established that the Abrahamic covenant was a relationship God had with Israel. That's eternal. And it goes on forever. But the Mosaic covenant was for fellowship. He wrote that so they can enjoy the relationship. So when they broke the law, and consistently enough, he would discipline them, put them out of the land, and they were not enjoying their relationship. But if they repented and came back, then they would be restored to fellowship, which I define as enjoying the relationship. So that, that should be out pretty soon. That sounds like a, a good book, good, good read. And yeah, it is good to have your commentaries on some of these books because people do ask about free grace sources for certain books of the Bible and so forth. And, and it's good to be able to refer them to your books and your work. So, Well, yours too. My sister is starting a Bible study up in uh, near Louisville, Kentucky. Asked me what to do. I said, well, get Charlie Bing's book. So <laughs> she got on online and ordered a couple of them. Which, which one? I hope is the right one. <laughs> they might get bogged down in some of them. but uh, Well, one, you've got kind of a workbook, don't you? What's yeah, the workbook, Living in the Family of Grace. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's a good it. one for a group to use. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, good, good. So um, when, you were, when you were pastoring, what people would come in from all different backgrounds. Uh, you don't have probably direct contact with a lot of your students. It's through your professors and so forth. But, but as a pastor, certainly a lot of people came into contact with you who didn't really understand grace. You had to probably explain it to them or they had to absorb it eventually from your sermons and messages. What difference did you see it make in their lives? Well, I'll give you an example. I went to uh, interview a woman for church membership with another elder and uh Oh, 10 minutes into it or so, she started crying. And being a man, you know, it's a woman sitting here with two men. I'm being a man, I think, uh oh, what did I say? You know? So I said, oh, I'm sorry. What, 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 what is it? She said, no, no, it's nothing you said. Uh, she said, I, I, I come from a church background in California uh, where the pastor one day said, if you have an ongoing sin in your life, you probably aren't a Christian. And I've had an ongoing sin for, about 20 years and uh she said i i'm a smoker and i've tried to quit and i just can't quit and i think it's hurting my body so it must be wrong but i can't stop it and i'm afraid that means i'm not a christian so she said i've never heard about the love you're talking about hmm. it brought her to tears and uh you know it's but through that kind of love there's even more motivation to live a godly life mm -hmm. and there's the enablement when you realize you're called to a supernatural standard, which you can't possibly live up to. So that requires supernatural enablement, supernatural power. And so it's the Holy Spirit's power, or you might say it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so uh, I've often said the hardest thing in the world for a non-believer to believe is the substitutionary death of Christ. But the hardest thing in the world for a believer to believe is the substitutionary life of Christ. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. As they learn more about that, they you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. And with freedom comes joy. Amen. And it seems like so many people get burned out or at least at the least frustrated, but sometimes just burned out and drop out because they can't keep they can't live the Christian life in their own strength right. um, and live up to others' expectations or what they think the Bible says they need to do to keep her. They get disillusioned. Yeah. They say, well, you know, it's working for Charlie Bing, but I, I just can't make it work. Either that or they become hypocrites or Pharisees and just pretend yeah. on the outside like it's working for them, but they really have doubts and fears and guilt right. inside. So, well, uh, Dave, it's been good chatting with you. I appreciate the time. Uh, it's always good to talk about grace and um, looking forward to hearing you soon at a conference. I know um, what, what is the best way for people to get in touch with? Well, I don't want them to delude, deluge you with emails or anything, but at least to know your, about your resources, where are they available? Well, I think if they just go grace school of theology, I just Google it. Uh, you could go gsot.edu. That's the, 
email address, but uh, Grace School of Theology in the Woodlands, Texas, that would take them to that and all the different stuff. But they also just, if they want if they want my books, just hit Amazon. And, but, you know, I noticed the other day, Amazon only lists two or three of my books. Huh. So you might need to know titles to go in there directly. I don't know. There's a glitch there somewhere. Yeah, there might be. Because uh, I know that Grace Theology Press is supposed to be putting them on Amazon. Right. Surely there's a tab to Grace Theology Press on the school website. I'm yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, they can get my book there too. So, Amen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you've been a champion of grace uh, and a trophy of grace. And uh, we appreciate the time and the uh, insights into the gift of grace is all about. So, yeah, I appreciate what you're doing, Charlie. I appreciate what you're doing. And uh, God bless you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. For more resources or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace at gracelife.org. See you next time.